Hello everyone, this is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 26 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, very good. Now, like any other time, we're not going to waste any time. We're going to just jump straight into part one on this week's show, of course, the review part of the show. We're going to start over on the Friday, of course. There was a card that took place over at York Hall, the British home of boxing, really. Gary Corker and top the bill. He moved to 15-0. and 0. He was fighting for the vacant WBO Intercontinental Super Waterweight title. He beat Danny Butler. So Gary Corker and now 15 and 0. Moving down that card, Tom Baker was also on the bill. He was fighting for the vacant English light heavyweight title. He moved to 13 and 0. He picked up that title. Sorry, um, Gary Corker and won his fight unanimously after 10 rounds. And of course, Tom Baker as well. Unanimous win after 10 rounds. Also on that bill, Romeo Romeo. He moved to 10 and 0. He picked up a TKO in the seventh round against Michael Dufek. I know that straight after the fight, O'Hara Davies, of course, everybody will know about him, signed with Eddie Hearn. He was actually at that fight, so he there was some sort of altercation between O'Hara Davies and Romeo Romeo after Romeo Romeo's fight. Uh, O'Hara Davies captured what was going on on his iPhone, I believe, but the sound was... I don't know why, but the, when the video went up, there was no sound on it, but basically... There's, there's hopefully going to be a fight. I think Romeo Romel will be happy to have that fight. I think O'Hara Davies wants a piece of him. So that'd be a really interesting fight if we get to see that down the line. Also on the bill, of course, Boy Jones Jr. He picked up a second round KO. So he now moves to seven wins. And of course, he's got the one draw. Anthony Yard also on the bill. He picked up a TKO in the first round. So Anthony Yard now five and oh, marching on to big, big, big things. Elsewhere in Aberdeen, Scotland, Gary Cornish returned to the ring after his first round slaying by Anthony Joshua. So Gary Cornish back in the ring. He fought a guy who only had one win, four losses and one draw going into this fight. It was only a six rounder, but Gary Cornish picked up a points win after six rounds. Later on in the evening, over in California at the Fantasy Springs Casino, Antonio Orozco, who is a welterweight to watch out for, believe me, he moved to 24-0 and with a TKO in the first round over Miguel Acosta. Also on that bill, Jason Quigley moved to 10-0. and Again, he got a KO in the first round over Freddie Lopez. So Jason Quigley, another name to watch out for, of course, if you don't already know. Okay, that's really it for Friday. We're now going to go over to Saturday. We're going to start nowhere else but the Wembley Arena. We're going to talk about the top of the bill fight. Of course, Nick Blackwell was defending his British middleweight title against Chris Eubank Jr. Nick Blackwell 19-3 and with one draw going into this fight. Chris Eubank, of course, 21-1. and Chris Eubank ended up getting a 10th round TKO. The reason it was a TKO was because the doctors stopped the fight. There was a huge, grotesque swelling above Nick Blackwell's left eye and the doctor decided to stop the fight. Nick Blackwell, if, if anybody tuned into the fight, if, ever, if if anyone saw the fight, of course, subsequently after that fight, Nick Blackwell was rushed to hospital and it was revealed that he had a bleed, I believe on his brain or on his skull, I'm not too sure, but he was placed into a medically induced coma in order for his body to recover. So um, it's not one of those things where he was beaten into a coma and he slipped into a coma and lost it for a while. He was actually placed into a coma for the better of his health, really, so that he can recover quicker. So um, just to give his body a rest, really. Again, I'm no medical expert, but like I say, Nick Blackwell, our prayers are with you on this show. We wish you the absolute best. Just goes to show, Ayaz, that this sport really, you know, this is a rarity that stuff like this happens, but, you know, this thing can happen at at the pinnacle of the sport. Our heart, like you said, goes out to Nick Blackwell and hopefully gets better. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, of course, yeah, Chris Eubank is now the new British middleweight champion with a record of 22 wins and the one loss. Moving down on the undercard now, Huey Fury, unfortunately, his fight wasn't televised. He moved to 19-0 and with a points win over Dominic Gwynn. Also on that bill, Ricky Boylan, he picked up his 14th career win, so his record now 14-3. and He picked up a points win after six rounds. Also on the bill, of course, Frank Bullioni, he picked up a TKO in the first round, his first fight with his new trainer, Don Charles. So Frank Bullioni now 18 wins, two losses and the one draw. That's it for Wembley. We're now going to go over to Sheffield Arena. Top of the bill, Kell Brook. He took care of his mandatory Kevin Bizier. Kell Brook now 36-0. and 0. He took out Kevin Bizier in the second round. So he picked up a TKO in the second round. Of course, he defended his IBF world welterweight title. It was a good fight whilst it... Well, it wasn't a good fight. It was a one-way pacing, to be honest, Iaz. But again, Kell Brook really does look the goods now, doesn't he? Kilbrook is a very good fight, and look what he just did to Kevin Busy within two rounds. I got rid of him, but now he needs to have a big fight in the summer. Yeah, we cannot wait to see who he's going to fight. Hopefully, Eddie Hearn can land a massive fight, whether it's in the UK or the USA, really. Yes, like he should have a fight against the winner of Bradley Pacquiao. There's rumours that regarding Miguel Cotto, Keith Furman versus Porter. There's another fight, Danny Garcia. He just needs to be in a big fight now to show like how good he is. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I'd be happy with any of those. But yeah, the way he took care of of, of Kevin Bizier was, you know, just as expected. A lot of people thought he was going to beat beat him within six rounds, but he took him out in two. So impressive stuff from Kell Brook. And that really is the way you deal with a mandatory challenger. So excellent stuff from Kell Brook. He marches on. Uh, also on that bill, Luke Campbell, he picked up the vacant Commonwealth lightweight title he actually defeated Gary Sykes and this was a TKO in the second round of course Luke Campbell this is an impressive win for him so it's good for him to pick up the vacant Commonwealth title so Luke Campbell now 13 and 1 also on the bill David Allen it was a strange old fight he was supposed to be fighting Richard Towers that ended up not happening David Allen fought late replacement woo Jason Gavin and of course, David Allen picked up his ninth professional win. He's obviously got the one draw on his record. So nine wins, one draw for David Allen. It wasn't really a fight, to be honest. Jason Gavin came for um, basically for the money, I believe. He His corner stopped the fight at the end of the fourth, and he didn't come out for round five. It was, it was a bit of a rough and tumble fight. There was a point where they both went down on the floor. It was almost like a bit of WWE-style wrestling. David Allen was very, very disappointed after that fight. I've seen an interview with him, and um, he was very disappointed about that fight. Also on that bill, Adam Etches, um, just before we talk about his fight... Whilst this whole situation has been going on with Nick Blackwell, Adam Etches has actually took time out to create a GoFundMe page so you can actually give um, a kind donation to Nick Blackwell. Of course, we're not sure if we're ever going to see him in a boxing ring again, so I'm not sure what he's going to do to earn a living. I know that Adam Etches, I believe, had a goal of trying to raise £10,000. I'm not sure how close or far away he is from that target, but of course... Adam Echi is a really good gesture there, and I know that a lot of people have been donating. So I just want to say a big thank you from the Box Hard podcast for those that have been donating. Of course, um, it's a rarity in boxing, as I say, but these things do happen. It just goes to show how dangerous this sport can be at times, you know. So a nice touch there from Adam Echi, nonetheless, and a nice touch of a win so he moved to 20 and 1 on Saturday at a matches with a TKO in the fourth round we had him on our show last week of course if you missed that it's available on YouTube it's available on SoundCloud and also on iTunes his opponent Zoltan Serra came over and like I say Adam Mitches was just too much for him on the night and that's really it for the UK we're going to end the UK side of the review part we're going to go straight over now to Oakland California. I'm going to let you take it away, Ayaz. Top of the bill, Andre Ward, 28 and 0. Sullivan Barrera, 17 and 0. Combined record of 45 and 0. These guys, okay, it's nearly a Mayweather record. Somebody's O had to go. Ayaz, talk to me. Wow, what can I say? Andre Ward's performance, very good. Literally, uh, he was like punch perfect. Andre Ward dropped Sullivan Barrera. I think it was in the second round. Sorry, in the third round, right? 
But this guy, Andre Ward, just like I re- he's just so good. Like he's he's skillful, and I reckon he's a pound for pound uh, boxing champion. Uh, now that Andre Ward's beating Sullivan Barrera, there's a talk that he could fight Sergei Kovalev in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Who would you back in that fight, by the way? I reckon Andre Ward beats him on points. Andre Ward on points. Okay, and uh, just to clear that up, Andre Ward, of course, beat Sullivan Barrera. Andre Ward was deducted a point in round eight, and he moved to 29 and 0 Andre Ward with a unanimous decision win after 12 rounds also on the undercard very 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 big prospect we must look out for this guy he's a featherweight he fought for the NABF featherweight title which was actually his own so he was defending it Joseph Diaz he moved to 20 and 0 he really is a name to look out for believe me he beat a guy called Jason Velez who's no slouch Jeeva Ayaz I know you're big on Joseph Diaz as what do you think about his performance well it was amazing this this guy i reckon in my opinion he's the next big star in boxing yeah absolutely i'd actually like to see him um you know perhaps in in the next few months or whatever really move up on that world stage and just 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 see where he is maybe fight a few guys who have fought for a world title just to get that measuring stick out and see how close he is to that type of level but I really think he is the goods if I have to say so myself um, definitely I'd like to see him in there with I mean could you just imagine if we saw Joseph Diaz in there with someone like Lee Selby what a fight that would be oh, what a fight that would be yeah that would be amazing absolutely absolutely okay we're going to leave the review inside of things right there I, as I believe that you've got a little bit of news for us just before we work up on our first guest Conor Nigel Benn has signed his professional contract with Matrim Sport and will be on the undercard of Martin Joshua on April 9th. Absolutely. Again, of course, this is son of a legend, really son of the Dark Destroyer. Of course, Nigel Benn. He's now got his son, Connor Nigel Benn. So this will be interesting. Everybody's seen the videos on Twitter, the way he trains. He seems to hit hard. He's got, you know, he's flashy. He's a good looking young kid. He's He's got big arms. He's got tattoos. I'm sure he's going to be an absolute hit. But we, we absolutely cannot wait to see him in the professional game. And he's signed with Eddie Hearn, of course, who I believe is probably the man to move him along. And it It'll be interesting seeing him on the undercard of such a massive fight. Again, not a lot of people make their debut on a double world title card. You know, of course, we've got the Lee Selby versus Eric Hunter. And of course, top of the bill, Charles Martin and Anthony Joshua. So that's a massive, massive, massive night for Conor Nigel Ben. Any other news for us, Ayaz? Yes, David Hay will face Arnold GG on May 21st at the O2 Arena. Yeah, absolutely. I was at the press conference today for that one. It was all crazy. It was all it was all calm. And then next thing you know, bang, the door gets kicked in. Shannon Briggs is walking in the room. Let's go, champ. Let's go, champ. It was absolutely hilarious, to be honest. I'd have been disappointed if he didn't turn up. I know that he said on Twitter he was going to turn up. I didn't know that until I was actually there. And then next thing you know, it just happened. It took us all by surprise. It seemed to, it seemed to annoy David a little bit it was it was brilliant to be honest but yeah again like I say the real piece of news is that David Hay will be fighting Arnold Gigi again of course this is Hay Day 2 and it's it's looking like it's going to be on terrestrial TV so another nice touch from David Hay uh, not, I don't really know too much about his opponent I know that he doesn't speak English I know he's got a nice record of 29 and 0 and of course 21 of those wins by knockout I know he's been sparring with Kubrat Pulev he's been sparring with Tyson Fury and also he's previously sparred with Vlad Vladimir Klitschko, so definitely he's mixed it amongst some of the top guys in the heavyweight division in sparring and stuff like that. But it'll be interesting to see. Most of his fights have took place in Switzerland. But yeah, like I say, it could be like a dark horse in the heavyweight division. He's got a good ranking and of course he's going to be facing David Hay. And also he has the second best undefeated record at the moment in the heavyweight division. Deontay Wilder, of course, 35-0, and 0, or 36-0, and 0, I think Deontay Wilder is now. I'm not too sure. And, of course, now this guy's 29-0. and 0. So, in terms of unbeaten streaks, this guy is second. So, a nice, juicy record, but we'll have to wait and see how good he really is on the night and how good David Hay really is on the night, of course. Any other news for us, Ayers? Nope, that's all we got this week. Okay, cool, cool. All right, that only means it's time for our first guest on this week's show. Okay, now it's time for our first guest on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former trainer of Derek Chisora, now training Frank Bullioni. It's Don Charles. Don, welcome to the show. 
Good afternoon. How are you? Very good, very good. First and foremost, how are you? I'm very well. It's a very nice sunny day today, so I'm, I'm fine with that. Once the weather is fine, I'm fine. Yeah, same same for all of us, really. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, you went quiet for a little while, Don. Um, what have you been up to since since the split with Chisora and, well, between the split with Chisora and last weekend, really? Um, basically, you know, um, obviously I'm known uh, for for the trainer of Derek Chisora. We've been together for a long time and uh, the work I've done with him, uh, he was the, basically what I'm known for, of course, but apart from Derek, I do train and have trained other fighters, um, which I... Sh- I I'm quite disappointed sometimes when I'm not recognized for those other, other fighters. Um, I'll name them. I trained Ashley Theo Payne to, to win his British title and defend it. Okay, Ashley Theo Payne, who's now fighting Adrian Broner. Um, and there's a young man called uh, uh, Jose Olishigan, a Nigerian fighter who was based here. He became a British citizen. He also won the British title with myself. Okay, and there's a young man called Yazim Elmachi, the showman whom I trained to win the, the prize fighter, okay? Uh, I also trained a heavyweight called Ian Lewison. Are you familiar with these names? Yeah, right. all of them, okay. yeah. So I do work with a number of fighters and have done so over the last 10 years. But obviously, there is such a high-profile fighter, so I'm only ever recognized for the work I've, I've done or did with Derek. But I do, I mean, these other guys, they didn't, they didn't go on to fight for world titles, except for Ashley Theop and who's now. Uh, fighting for a world title, so I have trained, you know, other other guys as well. So um, um, when you haven't or the public uh, haven't heard or uh, or from me once I split with Derek, yeah, I went back to the. I look at myself as a chef. <laughs> I went back to the kitchen to to carry on preparing the next meal. I've got um, a number of fighters that I'm bringing through. They're not known yet, but it probably takes about four stroke five years to bring them to the forefront where then people will start talking about them. So, you know, I'm a very patient man. Um, I'm not in a position, I never have been in a position where I'm not the type of trainer where I get given fighters, uh, ready-made fighters. Let's say, for instance, I've just inherited um, Frank Buglioni. Frank Buglioni came to me off his own accord. No promoter recommended to Frank Buglioni to go and train with Don Charles. He took the initiative to find me to ask me, would I be interested in working with him? A lot of trainers in the industries inherit fighters. They're in affiliation with certain promoters who constantly feed them with these ready-made, or let's say your Olympians, or people who get uh, ABA winners who get deals with major promoters. Automatically, that promoter, normally they're affiliated with a trainer of their choice. Okay, so they get the, the fighters get directed straight to these trainers, whether the trainer is any good or not. But the, the promoter will uh, give them the work. Yeah. So consequently, there are. I'm not just saying it's just myself. There are a number of very good trainers out there. Okay, who would do good jobs for these uh, uh, Olympians or ABA winners, but we don't get the opportunity, unfortunately. So you have to basically get your own fighters and develop them from scratch and that's what i do that's what i specialize in um i was going to ask you how the how the link up came between you yourself and bullioni but you touched on that um of course we didn't really get to see much of him because of the early knockout but how is he looking in the gym don well we've only been together for a very short period and i can categorically say to you this is the first time in my coaching career that i've got a fighter at that level who just walked into my gym and and asked me to work with him so He's come to me at uh, a very good level where the work I have to do for him, with him, is easy for me. I know exactly I'm not going to reveal, obviously, uh, what I'm doing with him. I'm training him in boxing, but the things that he needs to complete his style is what I um, speci- happen to specialize in. So we're working on that. And um, you're going to see a, a guy who, um, like I said, I'm excited about because this is the first time I can categorize you that you have uh, gotten into my camp, a guy who's like, very well schooled, very disciplined. And yeah, so I'm going to do some wonderful things with him in boxing because, um, like I said, I normally have to spend years and years and years of developing uh, uh, fighters from, from, from the grassroots, which I don't mind doing because I'm currently doing that anyway with about, about five fighters in different weight categories I'm, I'm, I've been um, developing in the last couple of years. And, and like I said, it'll probably take another couple of years 
before they'll start becoming British champions and uh, Commonwealth European champions. And uh, hopefully, if we carry on doing the good work, they'll end up on the world stage. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I just wanted to ask you about your relationship now uh, with Derek, because I know that it wasn't just really a training link up. It was more like father and son almost. It looked like it was one of the biggest shocks in boxing, to be honest, when when you guys split. What is the relationship like today with Derek and yourself? Yeah, I've always, I've always maintained Derek will always be, you know, regardless of what happens in the future, I will hold on to what we achieve together. I will always be proud of what we achieved together. Um, I'm disappointed in the sense that I don't feel I, com- I got to complete what I started with him. The aim was for us to go to the world championships, win win the world title. In fact, I'll go as far as unifying the, the world uh, the, the belt. Um, he was he was good enough to do that. But unfortunately, you know, I'm a strong believer in destiny. You know, um, through various uh, uh, personal reasons, then that was uh, my intention was to complete the journey with Derek. But unfortunately, we didn't get there. Um, we failed. We, 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 we had a challenge at the world title with Vitalik Klitschko. We, we fell short. We were given another opportunity to um, qualify to fight A. Klitschko, the, the Vladimir Klitschko, who, if I don't know if you can remember, uh, Six years ago, Vladimir Klitschko avoided Derek Chisora. We trained for the fight. We went to Germany. Three days before the fight was supposed to take place, he pulled out with injury. They postponed it. We came back to England. They were scheduled for April. Within two, three weeks of going back into camp, he cancelled it again. Then David Hay jumped in and fought him. So it's almost like it was never meant to be for us, uh, This uh, me and Derek winning the world title doesn't mean that Derek can't go ahead and do it. He can do it. He's got the ability to do it, provided he still remembers the dream that we had, the promise we made each other, that nobody gave us a chance initially. The boxing experts in this country said Chisora will not, is not even good enough to win the British title. We surpassed that by miles, okay? Um, if my boy can rediscover and remember what we initially set out to do, and I hope... With or without me, I hope he goes ahead and, and completes the, uh, that dream. Yeah, I hope so too. A lot of a lot of these uh, new school boxing fans who have just jumped into boxing seem to forget all this all this side of stuff. You know, they they're just going on what happened with David Hay and and everything after that. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the current heavyweight division, the landscape of it. It's a little bit of an old question, but I never saw anyone ask you it. Did you actually have Tyson Fury winning that fight with Klitschko? Did you think he would win before the fight took place? Did you did you have him winning that fight beforehand? Yes, I did, actually. I was probably one of the few people that believed that Fury would do it. In fact, I was disappointed because I actually thought I'd said that he would win it by, by knockout, um, whether it's TKO, yeah, by technical knockout, because I... I really didn't see Fury winning it on point because in Germany, it's very hard to get a decision against a Klitschko in Germany. The power they have, the hold they have over the, the, that division, I didn't believe it was possible to get a point win in Germany. Um, I, I thought he will stop Klitschko. And he came near to stopping Klitschko. And I believe if you watch the fight in round 11, he had Klitschko going. And I think had the referee not intervened, I think he, uh, he would have definitely got rid of Klitschko. And unfortunately, the referee intervened, intervened and saved Klitschko from, from that. So if it happens again, it's going to get worse for Klitschko. I think Tyson would definitely stop him this time round. Yeah, I believe I believe in, in what you're saying there. I agree with that. Um, a couple of questions I want to ask you now about potential fights that are happening. I want to start with, you mentioned, obviously, you used to train Ashley Fiafane. He's in a massive fight in just two days' time. Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. no, just tomorrow, actually, against That's Adrian right. Broner. Um, what, right. What's his chances of winning this fight? Ashley has got a very, very good chance of winning that fight. You know, I'm a person who, like I said, I always look myself, although I'm a coach, I, um, my, myself and my fighters, we're always the underdogs. And I always look at Ashley Theopen has been is the underdog for this fight. But Ashley Theopen is well-seasoned, yeah? He's matured, very heavy-handed, because I used to train him at, at that weight, it doesn't punch it. It punches above his weight, that guy. 
very heavy-handed for the weight, and he's a very determined young man. He's very fit. The way I describe it to people when I'm describing uh, or explaining how the fight will go, Marcus Madonna gave Edwin Broner all kind of problems, yeah? He beat him, right? Now, Ashley Silpen, as far as I'm concerned, is a better skilled and schooled fighter than uh, Marcus M M Madonna, yeah? So, for that reason, I'm going to go for a Silpen win. I think uh, Edwin Broner, you could see he's rattled. He's if you watch the press conferences, if you watch the the face off, and he's a very rattled man. He's very disturbed because he could see. Because Ashley Stephen has one of those faces, poker faces. He'll, I've seen that guy spar so many rounds in my gym when I was training him. You can't tell when he's hurt and when he's hurt. it doesn't show pain whatsoever. Yeah, he plays. He's got poker face. Even in their face off, Bruno can't work him. Bruno is trying to unsettle him. You could see his facial expression doesn't change at all. And he's very determined. I've spoken to him. He's very, very determined. I, I told him to gra grow another pair of arms in addition to the arms he's got ready to grab the opportunity that's been presented to him. And I really do believe he's going to pull it off. I really hope so, too. Um, we had him on the show last week and it was good to hear him talk. He was in good spirits. And of course, Floyd Mayweather is backing him to beat Broner in this. Absolutely. So that's an interesting I mean, point. I'm not, I'm not being funny. If Floyd didn't think that uh, he doesn't want to let somebody who he promotes and to gun, um, you know, as in let the fight down. Floyd's got faith in that boy. And I'm, and I'm telling you, um, Ashley Philpen will beat that Adrian Broner. Yeah, he will. And Ashley is very determined. Okay. And I know that kid really well. He's very cool. He's not rattled by anything. He's matured. He's not like some 21 year old guy who, you know, going to maybe break under pressure. Ashley is very seasoned. Yeah, if you cast your mind back, Ashley still, I believe they beat Garcia when they fought a few years ago, if you remember that. Yeah? He's boxed, a very, he's boxed a lot of good good fighters who are making noise out there today. And, uh, you know, he's, he's got the experience to do what's necessary and beat, beat, beat this guy, Brona. Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, I really hope so. And, yeah, again, another fight that a lot of people forget. Um of course, David Hay has made his comeback recently. He fought on July, mm -hmm. the, sorry, January the 16th, and he's now fighting on May the 21st. What do you think of his return to the ring, Don? Can he get to the top again? Most definitely. You know, he's, the guy's a very intelligent human being. He's a, a good salesman. Um, the, the, the industry, the heavyweight division needs people, the likes of your David Hay. You know, it makes it all very interesting. Um, he's British. And, um, yeah, I'm glad to see him back and I'm glad to see him doing what he does best, selling fights and um, entertaining because, you know, he's a very explosive fighter and it brings, it brings all action and, um, you know, it's good. It's very good for, for, for boxing. Yeah, of course. Also, there's a fight being made in the heavyweight division. Um, Wilder will be facing his mandatory in Alexander Povetkin. How do you see that fight going, Don? Mm. Very, very, very tricky for Wilder. I see Wilder losing that fight. Oh, wow. I didn't expect you to say I, that. Yeah. I, I, well, I see Wilder because Povokin, as we know, he's only ever lost to Vladimir Klitschko, who was fouling him. He, he might as well call that match a wrestling match because the referee did nothing about it whatsoever to stop Vladimir wrestling him to the ground. He never got, I don't believe he, maybe he got one point taken off. He should have been actually disqualified rather than one point taken off round about round eight or something, the referee eventually, I think he cautioned him and then, you know, um, right, foul. Provoking is very well scored, yeah? This version of provoking you're seeing now is used to dealing with uh, tall guys. It's not going to be a problem, okay? And, um, yeah, um, it's one of those fights. It could, it could go in there and, and Wilder does what he does and uh, balls a big run and nothing out. But I, some reason, I've just got, I've got my reasons, but I, I believe when I look at the fight and dissect it technically, how it's going to go, I do see Provokin, he's got the experience, he's been in there with top opposition all through his career, and I think, I could think, I'd hate using the word upset, you know, because we've got every, Provokin has been established much, much prior to um, uh, Wilder coming onto the scene and, and, uh, and, and doing what he has done remarkably, he's done really, really well, Wilder. Yeah, he really surprised me, his performance against the Vern. I didn't think he was capable of doing what he did as in boxing on his back foot and really, he boxed really well that day and to win the, the, the world title. So I know he's vulnerable to various, uh, various things. 
um, that Pavokin brings to the table. And I really do see Pavokin um, uh, doing well and, and to the degree where I believe he'll, he'll win that fight. OK, very interesting breakdown. I want to talk about now, of course, Charles Martin coming over here to face Joshua. It's happening literally in nine days' time. What do you see? Mm-hmm. How do you see this fight going, Don? Maximum four rounds in favour of Anthony Joshua by KO. Sweet and simple, yeah? Big Short capital and... KO. Big KO. You don't think it's that the six... It's me... Go on, Sorry. go on, Don. Do you think that the, the, the size at all... I know that well, he's around the same sort of height as uh, as mm. Joshua and of course Southpaw big pa- big mm. punching power a lot of knockouts mm. mm-hmm. no no he threat post no you've got the Olympic champion here who's who's uh, incredibly very very quick incredibly explosive incredibly hungry trains very hard very very determined very very confident and I know the kid really well because I think he realizes he's always risen to the occasion on numerous occasions he's risen to the occasion and uh the Olympic, winning the Olympic medals in your own country, there's a lot of pressure. It's all very well having it in your country, but there's a lot of pressure that comes with it. He's always come up trumps, and I don't see any difference with this fight. Martin, as far as I'm concerned, is not a typical awkward southpaw from what I've seen of him. Um, he doesn't have the lateral movement, of, uh, the snapback counter a normal southpaw has, and it doesn't have the footwork to move the target, you know. I think it's a bit too stationary to fight Joshua. And if he's going to stand in front of Joshua, then I'm afraid it's going to be an early night. And that's what I see happening. I, don't, I can't see him boxing clever in the sense he's going to use the ring and um, try and... He hasn't got a jab, okay? So, no, I don't, I've looked at it, examined it. I, I think, it's, again, uh, Joshua has to box clever. You know, obviously, the only chance I'm giving Martin, no disrespect to him, he's the world champion. The only chance I'm giving him is the fact that he's a southpaw, that Josh might need to be a bit more cautious, work it out, take your time, dissect him, then take him out. And I don't see uh, Martin, really can't say, I can't, I can't say uh, him doing, causing any, any, any problem for, for Josh. Like I said, we have to respect, because southpaws can be, you know, uh, tricky. I'm sure Josh is inspiring southpaws in his preparation. Um, to get used to the angles and where to put the foot and stuff like that. But I don't think Martin is a typical, uh, he's not even a, an Audley Harrison type of southpaw. Um, as much as all people slay Audley Harrison, one of that guy, he can also punch and he's also got that snap back where he will let you lead and he'll snap back and counter you and take you out. Audley has that. Um, I don't even think Martin has that. So, um, no, I do see, I only see one result, then that's an Anthony Joshua victory. And, and to be how, how wonderful would that be to, for him to be a world champion in his 16th professional fight? You know, so, yeah, and he's, uh, he's representing. And at the end of the day, look how many world champions Britain is boasting at this moment. It's not, I don't ever remember it being like this. Yeah, absolutely. Like you say, um, again, if we were to get, if, if Fia Fein is to win tomorrow night and then next week Joshua wins, that's, that's more. Exactly. Um, you know, yeah, we, we've got more world that, champions. Britain right now, I don't care what anyone says to me, it, this is where it's at, yeah? This is where it's at. When was the last time you heard an American coming over, bringing his belt to Britain to defend it? First defence. It doesn't happen, does it? No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, this is where, but yeah. this is where it's at. This is where it's at at the moment. It is more more uh, world champions than any other nation. So, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The last two questions I've got for you now, Don, I just want to ask your opinion on... Uh, Chisora going over to fight Pulev, which is a little bit of a strange one, to be totally honest. But again, Chisora does the unexpected. How do you see that fight going? Well, you know, it's a great opportunity for, for my guy to um, to bring himself back to contention, to be able to contest. Because the way the world titles are at the moment, those belts are going to be swapping hands on a regular basis. So you have to put yourself in a position to be able to grab one of those belts. You have to take a chance in this life. Um, the opportunity came along and uh, to fight for the European title, which propels you straight back up. Because once you've won the European title, you may have maybe one defense to get yourself in a mandatory position to fight for one of the belts with one of the governing bodies. So it's about placing yourself in the, in, in the right place. So the fight itself, yeah, a very awkward fight because Pulev is a very awkward guy. Um, he's not blessed with skills. Um, he's a very strong man, very mentally, physically strong, but it's not that complicated to work him out. So Derek, I believe, will be victorious, will, 
in that fight, and provided he uh, remembers the style that he we originally practiced, he has to practice it, go through his drills, and um, stay hungry, desire, and uh, go and do what's necessary. And yeah, I, I think Derek beats him all day long. I really do because you know you 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 have to do, and I believe he will remember. I've spoken to him. I've reminded him what he has to do, although we don't, I'm not working with him. Uh, the reason you're calling me and, and giving me an interview, um, again, the name, uh, my name is Don Charles, but I'm only known because uh, I worked with someone like uh, Derek Chisora, who um, brought me the recognition through our achievements we, we achieved together. So um, he still calls me for advice, and all the, the advice is always there. Yeah, of course, of course. Now, I've, I've thrown quite a few tricky questions at you. You seem to answer them cool as a cucumber really i've left this question till last uh, i don't mean mm-hmm. to put you on the spot or whatever but taking yourself out of the equation who do you think mm-hmm. is the best trainer right now in britain okay after me yeah after yourself <laughs> <laughs> um one thing about me when you ask me a question i will dissect it i will um give you the truth if i'm a f- I, I i love football okay and i support tottenham hotspur right <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I um, think you. I think you're just trying to buy a few seconds here, Don. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just trying to. I don't want one thing again. I hate being misunderstood. That's why I go along with my son. I have a son. My son always has a guy on me because, Dad, why don't you just say yes or no? But some some questions you can't give a yes or a no because I have to explain it. Otherwise, you're gonna misunderstand me, and I hate being misunderstood. So therefore, I will I will break it into piece little segments, and I put it together and give it back to you. So how? How do you judge a football manager? How do you judge a football manager? Um, in today's yeah. sport, um, yeah. well, really, it would have to be on success. Thank you. That's, that's all I wanted to hear. Right. So based on success, based on achievement, at this present time, you have to give it to Joe Callagher. Based on, based on uh, what the guy has achieved in the last four or five years, you have to give it to him. Yeah, no, like I say, no one can argue with that. He, he has got a lot of success at the moment. And of course, he's got Crawler you, you don't, and you the don't rest get, of the guys. You, you don't get, you know, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm here for the long run. And by the grace of God, God gives me strength and health, stay healthy. I intend in the next 10 years, because I've already put 10 years into it, and I fell very short. With, with Chisora, I came very near, but we fell short. In the next 10 years, I will produce champions after champions in different weight categories, yeah? So, unfortunately, I've put 10 years in and I haven't produced a world champion. I've produced three British champions in three different weight, weight categories. Prize fighter champions, Southern Area champions, European champions. So, I have not produced a world champion. So, therefore, that's my quest, is to produce world champions in different weight categories categories and I will do that in the next 10 years so right now yes someone like Joe Callagher is right up there he will he's the number one coach in this country based on achievements yeah um, what he's produced and achieved you, you if you differ if the your listening uh, audience uh, disagree well let's have a debate debate about it tell me who would they will put it's not just about one person producing one person then they, you can't become uh, the best coach in the country on overnight because you've trained one champ, world champion. No, it has to be all the other fighters you train. What have they won? British title? Every title counts from Southern Area title to British to Commonwealth to European to then to world. You have to take all those in account because a football manager, have you won the FA Cup? Have you won the Carling Cup? Have you won the European? Uh, it's all the cups. All the cups matter. So when you're judging uh, the train out uh, on the, uh, who's the, you have to take into account what they've achieved over over the over the years. Yeah, definitely, definitely, excellent stuff. Okay, listen, Don. Um, thank you very much for giving us a bit of time. Thank you very much for giving us your insightful views. Uh, you're a true gentleman, and I wish you the absolute best with the success with Bullioni and the other guys coming through. Don, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, bro. It's my pleasure.
Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. Of course, on part one, we do the review part. On part two, we do the preview part. Now it's time to do the preview part. We're going to start on the Friday. We're going to start over in Washington, D.C. Top of the bill, Adrian Broner. He defends his WBA world lightweight title against Ashley Fearfame. We had him on the show a couple of weeks back. Adrian Broner, of course, 31 and 2. Ashley Fearfame, 39 and 6 with one draw. This will be an interesting fight while it lasts, Ayaz. This is going to be such a good fight, and I reckon, in my opinion, Broner's going to beat him on points. Oh, it's a tough one to call. It's a tough one to call. Remember that, of course, Mayweather and Broner were really, really good friends. I'm not sure what the relationship's like now, but this is the first time that uh, Mayweather's actually siding with someone against Broner. So, of course, this is this is a first. Mayweather believes, like I say, I'm I'm, I'm quoting Ashley Fearfane here. Mayweather believes that Ashley Fearfane can beat Broner. That's the reason why he made the fight. So, it's going to be an interesting contest. I really cannot wait for that one. It's, I really cannot wait for that one. It's, it's definitely a must-see. Also on the undercard, Robert Easter Jr. He's 16-0 and at the moment. He faces Algenis Mendez, who has a record of 20. 23 and 3 with one draw. Also on that bill, Javonta Davis. Now we know that he's got a close knit relationship with Mayweather. He's at the moment is 14 and oh, he faces Guillermo Avila, who has a record of 16 and 5. Javonta Davis, remember that name, I'm telling you. He's in the super featherweight division and he really is going to burst on the scene soon enough. Anthony Peterson also on the bill. That's the brother of Lamont Peterson. He has a record of 36 and 1. He faces Samuel. Kote Nkwe who has a record of 22 and 1 that should be a decent little scrap also on the bill J. Leon Love a lot of people know about him he's also a Mayweather fighter as well he has a record of 21 and 1 he faces Michael Gumbenga I'm not sure if I've pronounced that right, who has a record of 21 and 24. So J. Leon Love really should get the win there that's really it for the Friday We're now going to move over to the Saturday. We're going to start with a card taking place in Finland. Just one fight I want to mention over there. This is for the vacant WBC silver heavyweight title. Robert Hellanius, 22-0. He faces Johan Duapas. Of course, we've seen him in there with Deontay Wilder recently. Duapas has a record of 33 and 3, so that'll be an interesting little clash. Now we're going to move over to Poland. A guy who we had on our show again, I think it was around Christmas time, something like that. A really nice guy, and also a former opponent of Deontay Wilder. Eric Molina, he's traveling over to Poland in the hometown of Thomas Adamek. So we'll start with the way the fight's going to be called. Thomas Adamek, 50 wins and 4 losses. He fights Eric Molina, 24 wins and three losses. This is for the vacant IBF Intercontinental heavyweight title. So this should be a good scrap because Eric Molina, really, really nice guy and a really good fighter, really, really underrated. Not a lot of the time he gets much notice for fights, but when he does turn up, I mean, he told us before, I have hurt everybody I've been in a ring with professionally and in sparring. Again, I know a lot of fighters talk, but Eric Molina did have Deontay Wilder in a bit of trouble during that fight. Just look at the tape if you don't believe me or if you slip your memory. I'm telling you, Eric Molina is no joke. We wish him the absolute best of luck. And in my opinion, I, I really, I'd like I'd like to see him win. It's going to be a tough fight. We know that Thomas Adamek is past his best eyes. Could this be the right time for Eric Molina to get a seriously notable win on his record? It will be, in my opinion. I reckon, I reckon it'll be good if he wins this fight. Yeah, definitely. It would definitely set up some big clashes in that division. Also on the undercard, Andre Warwick. He has a record of 31 and 1. That's in the heavyweight division. He faces Marcin Rakowski, who has a record of 17 and 2. That really is another fight to look out for. Okay, that's it for Poland. Now we're going to bring ourselves over to Liverpool at the Echo Arena. Where else? Top of the bill, Hadila Mohamedi, who has a record of 20 wins and 3 losses with 1 draw. He faces Callum Smith, 18-0. and 0. If you don't know Callum Smith, you must have been hiding under a rock. He faces Mohamedi. Mohamedi is the EBU European super middleweight champion. So this is for his belt. So if Callum Smith wins this, this will set up some serious fights down the line for Callum Smith. I cannot wait for this one, by the way. Callum Smith, um, I, as I know you don't know too much about Mohamedi, but do you think he's going to win this fight comfortably? We saw his last fight where he stopped Rocky Fielding. I reckon in this fight, he's going to stop Mohamedy. 
Yeah, you got a good point. You know, I wouldn't want to bet against Callum Smith getting the knockout. He seems to get a lot of knockouts. The better the opposition, the better he performs, I almost feel as well. Also on that bill, as you just mentioned, Rocky Fielding, he comes back to the ring. He faces Christopher Rebrath. Again, Christopher Rebrath, we've seen him in there with George Groves and, and a couple of others. Rocky Fielding, this again is for the vacant WBC International Super Middleweight title. Rocky Fielding, 21-1. and one. Christopher Rebras, 24-4 and four with three draws. This would be a tough test for Rocky Fielding. Um, how do you see this fight going, I ask? Because I know that Rocky Fielding can bang, but Rebras, is he's got a good chin on him as well. This is where I'm going to go for it. It's a 50-50 fight. Mm, I'm not too sure I'd say it's a 50-50. I definitely think that Rocky Fielding has got the edge, and I really hope I'm right, because if Rocky Fielding loses to Christopher Rebras, then he really has to drop down a level. Um, also on that undercard, of course, Scott Cardle, the rematch between Scott Cardle and Sean Masher Dodd. This is for the British lightweight title. Of course, they fought last year. It was a good fight, and this is the rematch. Scott Cardle, 19-0. and Sean Dodd, 10-2. and also on that bill, Tom Doran, he looks to move to 17-0. and 0. He has a tasty record of 16-0 and 0 at the moment. This is for the vacant WBC international middleweight title. He faces Luke Keeler, who has a record of 10-1. and 1. He's a 10-rounder at middleweight, of course. Also on the bill, Paul Smith, he gets back in the ring. 35 wins, 6 losses. He faces Daniel Reggie. I think this is just like a keep-busy fight. It's only a 6-rounder just because Paul Smith really wants to get back into title contentions. Daniel Reggie has a record of 28 wins and 13 losses. Like I say, it's only a six rounder. It's a light heavyweight, this one as well. Moving down that bill again, Reese Belletti, prospect trained by Jimmy Mack and Jimmy Mack Jr. Reese Belletti, 5 and 0 at the moment. He faces Julio Betrago. Julio Betrago has a record of 13 wins and 18 losses. And that's really it for the preview side of things. Again, we just absolutely whizzed through the review, whizzed through the news, and whizzed through the preview. We didn't do too much talking on this week's show. We're now going to bring on our second guest. Okay, now it's time for guest number two on this week's show. Fresh off his win on Saturday, it's Ricky Boylan. Ricky, welcome to the show. Hi, mate. Thanks, thanks for having me. No problem, no problem. First and foremost, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Uh, just just uh, happy to be back to winning ways. How did it feel in there on Saturday night? Obviously, it's your first fight of 2016. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd, I'd obviously been out of the ring well, I think it was seven months prior to that. My last fight was in September. So it was just all about shaking the rust off, you know. And, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd been working on a few things in the gym, um, you know, just trying to move my feet and use my jab a little bit more. And to be honest, I'd, I'd, I'd done that down to a T. So I was, I was really happy with my performance. Um, will you actually be staying at 140? Because I know you came in a bit heavier than that. Obviously, there was no title on the line or anything. But will, will you be staying at 140 or moving up at all, Rick? Yeah, no, I'm going to stay at 140. Um, obviously, I'd only had three weeks' notice for that, so it weren't worth me. Uh, to be fair, I probably could have got a little bit lower, but he was coming in around that anyway, so they said just coming at 10 stone 10, I think it was. But uh, my next fight, I'm having it well away. It's obviously 10 7, and I, w- I will make uh, 140 again, but, um, you know, just, just when it matters, really. Championship, championship fights, isn't it? Now, of course, all you know the the three losses you got on the record. They're all they're all close decisions in most cases. Um, you had a pretty bad twelve uh, month period from October two thousand and fourteen to October two thousand and fifteen. Any of those? Is there any? Are you chasing any of those for rematches at all? Um, to be honest, I, I'd like them all. I'd like to to you know try and put them all right. Um, at the moment, as I said, I'm just just working on things in the gym, and one step at a time, I'll get myself back there. I'm not in no rush. I'm still, you know, I'm still only 27 years old, so you know, I'm not I'm not in a real rush. Um, but yeah, one one fight at a time, and you know, I'm sure I'll get myself back up there. Obviously, the the three L's are from uh, Tyler Goodjohn, Tommy Martin, and Danny Connor. Who do you think's the best out of those that little trio there? Who's the who's the best the best fighter out of those three? Uh, I'd say Tommy Martin. To be fair, um, he's got a good jab, he's got fast hands, and he's he's pretty good on his feet. You know, um, Tyler Goodjohn won. You know, uh, that, that that was a it was a close fight, and it was a good fight, and the same as the, the Danny Connor defeat, but. You know, they're, they're all they're all fights that I believe I can win. 
um, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll get the chance to put, put things right. Of course. Now, your next fight, I believe, has already been announced. Is it... Um... It's uh, May the 7th at your call. So May the 7th. Be, think, five weeks away. Yeah, um, that's um, that's that's at one forty-seven. You said, Is yeah, one forty-seven. Any idea of who you're going to be fighting yet? I know we're we're a few weeks out, but any idea at all? Uh, I'm I'm not too sure yet. They only announced it yesterday. Uh, they only asked me if I want to get on the show yesterday. So you know, I've, I'd obviously just boxed, and I, I'd said to a few promoters that if any opportunity comes for me to get on their shows, then just please let me know and you know this coming up so obviously I only box at the weekend just gone so I just want to stay as busy as I can now really that'll be two fights in two months basically so it'll be good yeah I did actually want to touch on that who what's the score with with yourself promotionally at the moment um obviously I was, I was with Matrim and uh but my con my contract ran out about I don't know, I think six months ago something like that with them, but I'd still been boxed. No, it was, it was longer than that. It was about a year ago, actually, my contract went out. But I'd still been boxing on their shows. So, yeah, you know, obviously, the opportunity came back up to, to sign with them again or whatever. And I'd jump at it. But um, at the moment, as I said, just just one step at a time and uh, work, my, work myself, work my way back up there. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm, I'm not, not promoted by no one at the minute, but just going to box on whatever show I can get on and then go from there. Yeah, I mean, that that may be that may be the best thing to do, to be honest, at the moment. Um, how important is it, this is a bit of a silly question, really, but how important is it for 2016 uh, for you to get back to winning ways, of course, and put that 12-month dark period behind you, you know, finally? Yeah, oh, it's, it's massively important, you know. Um, there, was, there was a couple of times in the Tommy Martin, all, all them three, three defeats, I truly believed that I was I was going to beat them all. And, uh, you know, as I said, I was going, I had a little bit of a bad bad run and, you know, I think it showed in the ring. But um, hopefully uh, I can start to show people that, I, you know, I can box, I've got a good boxing brain when I use it. And, you know, I'm not just a one-dimensional fighter, come forward fighter. So, yeah, this is very important these next next 12 months and, you know, I believe I'll get myself back up there. Now, I know that, of course, you're training. Um, you, 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 Cameron has got you doing quite a few drills now. Uh, how has yeah. that changed? How has that changed the way you were training before? How has that, what's that done for you uh, fitness-wise? Uh, Cam Cameron's brilliant, to be fair. But you know, I, I always, no matter what fight from from the very start, or even my amateur career, I've always had myself in top condition, you know. And um, you know, Cameron Cameron's just just uh, pushing me that little bit further. But I was training with Cameron even when I was in Manchester. But I would come back the odd weekend here and there, and and then do my sessions with him. But Obviously now I'm back down here. I've been doing two sessions a week with him, so yeah, he, he gets me in good condition and you know gets me nice and strong at the weight, so it's good. Now I know that you're not you're not one to sort of start calling people out, but is there anyone on the domestic scene at the moment you've got your eye on? I know that you want to chase those three rematches, but is there anyone apart from those those fights there that you got your eye on at fighting in the future? Um, as I said, Joe, just taking one step at a time. You know, obviously. I've had them three defeats and, you know, it's, it's knocked me down the ladder a bit. So um, it's just, just a case of working on a few things in the gym and trying to put, put you know, a few, few mistakes that I've been making, trying to put them right. And and then, uh, yeah, as I say, one step at a time. But, you know, I'd, I'd love, love to get my Southern Area title back and then maybe go for the English and, and go from there. So whoever's got it at the time, then... Yeah, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's the belts more than anything. It's not no one in particular, but yeah, them them three defeats I'd obviously like to fight all them and put put them right. But yeah, just one step at a time. Yeah, I really hope you get that because, like I say, those those defeats were, were were close, all of them, to be totally honest. So it's not like yeah. you, you know your career is not 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 written off anytime soon. Um, who is the best, in your opinion, at 140 domestically? I know that we've got the likes of Jack Catterall coming through. A lot of people would probably say him. Um, do you think he's the best at 140, taking yourself out of the equation? Um, in in all honesty, I've not seen lots of Jack. You know, I've, I've seen bits of him, and I see him box some Argentinian guy. And and to be honest, I wasn't overly impressed. And that's no disrespect to Jack. 
you know, as I say, I was not overly impressed. But the Argentinian, he looked very awkward, to be fair. So, 140, uh, you know, obviously you got Lenny Dawes. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's a great fighter. He's, he's experienced and that. Um, it's John Wayne Hibbert who's doing well. Um, do you know what? I, I, I couldn't even put, put it on one person who, who I'd say the best is in Britain. Um, Tyrone Nurse is another one who's really skillful. You know, if, if Tyrone could punch, he'd, he'd go all the way, I believe. But um, he's, he's the most skillful, I, I think, out of out the 140 division at the moment. One name that you didn't mention there, um, he's actually in a massive, you know, in a world title fight tomorrow night. We we sometimes Ashley forget Fear he's British, Fame. of course. Yeah, Ashley Fearfane. Yeah. Um, how do you see that fight going down between Adrian Broner and Ashley Fearfane? Do you give him any sort of a chance, Ricky? I, I pray to God, to God he wins. You know, uh, he, he's not he's not done anything. He, he's had it the hard way the whole way along. You know, and uh, I was I was sparring with him about probably about eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, and had a good spa with him. Um, I hope, I hope, as I say, I hope he does it, but it's, it's a big ask, you know. Um, hopefully, he's, he's very fit, actually, all the time. He's, you know, he's, he's strong, so I just, you know, hopefully he can catch Broner and get him out of there, but it's a big ask. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, uh, the last question I'm going to ask you now, just your prediction on another upcoming fight. Um, it's kind of that welterweight, it's kind of that, its own division, really. Uh, Canelo and Khan. What's your views on that, Rick? To be honest, I, I've, I've, I've always, you know, when it was announced, Canelo is an amazing fighter. But I think if Khan boxes the right fight and uses his hands and feet, I, I truly believe that he can beat Canelo. Um, I know he's the underdog, but he has got very, very fast hands and fast feet. And if he doesn't, you know, get involved when he doesn't need to, then, as I say, I think he can beat him. God willing, God willing. All right, Rick, just before I let you go, I want to give you an opportunity to uh, shout out any anyone you want to shout out or say a thank you to any sponsors or anything like that. Yeah, just a big thank you to my main sponsors, Roadwell Cups, um, GVC Vans, Muscle Food, USANA and Nuffield Health. Excellent stuff. All right, Rick, listen, thanks for giving us a bit of time so close after your fight. I wish you the absolute best. I wish you uh, all the luck and hope that hope that you get those rematches and, and you know, and show them what, what Ricky Boylan is all about. No problem. Thank you very much. OK, now it's time to conclude episode 26 of the Box Hard podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Aya Sumra has been Aya Sumra. Thank you very much to our two guests that joined us on this week's show, Don Charles and Ricky Boylan. Again, a massive thank you and the biggest thank you to the listeners that have listened this far. Thank you for giving us your ears yet again this week. We'll be back next week with another big show. Please keep retweeting, favouriting, liking, subscribing and all the rest. And we'll be back next week with another buster of a show. Until then, take care.